Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. The great book of Job. Remember, Job means persecuted. And Job being a type of God's elect that God can tell Satan, hey, what do you think about my boy Job? You can't get to him, Satan. You take everything away from him, I can get to him, Satan said. So this is kind of a, a contention and strife between God and Satan, and poor old Job is kind of the ping pong ball in between, especially when you count on three friends that are of Esau and other peoples that seemingly know everything and yet really know nothing. And they continue accusing Job, said, hey, you've got to have sinned to be getting all this on top of you. And they're really picking at Job, trying to get him to level up, be honest. And Job truly hasn't done anything. Uh, Job was a man that even uh, repented in offerings for things his children might have done. Not did, but might have done. So uh, he was very careful in that respect of loving and trusting the Father. And then his world falls apart. So... Um, we uh, pick it up here as, um, as Bildad, the son of contention, continues his first round of debates here. And he got a little sarcastic right at the end and said, you know that God is just. Why are you, why are you not leveling? Chapter 9, verse 1. And then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth. But now, but how should man, that's to say mortal man, be just with God? So I know God is just, but how are we going to be just with him? And of course, you got to bear in mind, Job is trying to put all this together in his mind. Why has my world fallen apart? I didn't do anything. I don't know what it is that's displeasing God. You see, he's letting Satan off the hook. Don't you ever do that. He's wondering, it isn't a matter of pleasing God, it's a matter of getting up on your haunches and start kicking dragon, all right? Especially in this generation, that's what you do because we have power and authority over them in Christ's name. So compared to God, though mortal man, Enosh, he's, he's not much, all right? In other words, that that is created has a tough time dealing with the creator. Verse 3. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. If, if um, um, man can't answer one of God's questions, much less a thousand, or pick one out of a thousand. Why, Father is so far above us. And especially, um, again, I, I find this, uh, the simplicity of knowing the data involved by that, the facts involved, let's put it that way, is that Satan and God had a little discussion over how good Job was. And this, in, a, in essence, is what's happening. But it can be so confusing to man to try to understand the higher things. Again, we go back to the fact um, that um, Job's friends are blaming Job and Job is not really blaming God, but he's saying, how can I please God that he's just? Why, why can't I figure this out? And Satan's getting off the hook free. Nobody's stomping him. Nobody's blaming him. And it's all his fault. God allowed him to do it, okay? Don't let that happen in your life, okay? Let's continue on. Next verse, verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. In other words, you might even say he's lived to tell about it. You don't, there's no way you can contend or fight with God and, and uh, he's, he's in charge. Verse 5, which removeth the mountains and they know not. In other words, he does it so suddenly they even have no warning, the mountains, which overturneth them in his anger, meaning earthquakes and so forth. God is able to do, what, what can poor little old man do? Six, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Just shake. 
Now, Job's getting pretty close here, as you will find out ultimately when by the time we get to chapter 40 to what God wants him to realize, all right? With love, of course. Job never stopped loving God. Seven. Which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. He locks them up and sets boundaries. How many do we not see? And yet at the same time, this can be translated in a different way to say he can, he can control the clouds to cover the sky with overcast. Eight. Which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. In other words, the waves of the stars, the universe, and, and the sea itself, um, uh, and the very heights of the sea, we should say, the sea that is the heavens. To document that, verse 9, which maketh Arturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, and the chambers of the south being the uh, uh, called the uh, congregation, so to speak. What is, um, let's take it first with Arturus, is the bear keeper, the, the um, chief herdsman, okay, that old big bear. And Orion is always thought to be the coming prince or symbolic of the coming prince. And of course, Pelaides being the elect or the sweet influence on the congregation you would uh, by the judge, and the judge being those chambers to the south. Verse 10, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Just Man just can't keep up with all of it. It's awesome when you look out there in the heavens and see these things. God knows. And, and when, you, when you compare that to man's little problems here on earth, though they at times seem to be surmountable. Um, actually, according to our Father, there's nothing impossible with Him. And listen to me, that's why you must always stay in Him. Because in Him, nothing is impossible. Verse 11. Uh, Lo, He goeth by me, and I see Him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. I can't see him. In other words, we know here that the, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the Heavenly Father. Uh, does Job understand dimensions? Well, it would seem so. It would seem perhaps he's considerably wiser than some might think, even back at the time of this writing, which is one of the older books of the Bible. 1500, roughly B.C. Verse 12. Behold, he taketh away, who can hinder him? Who could stop him? Who will say unto him, why dost thou? I don't, I don't think any of you would. It's not good to argue with your father or question him. He has a way of being a little bit, um, I'm not going to say impatient, but he is one that chastises rapidly. Verse 13. If God will not redraw, withdraw his anger, uh, I would rather translate that if God um, withdraweth not his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. In other words, th this, this is a little more said. Let me, the Hebrew says the, um, the proud helpers are the sons of, of, um, of Rahab. Right? And Rahab in the Hebrew tongue means wide, the wide dimension that would um, help him. They even, they, as great as they are, they lie prostrate before him. They, wouldn't, they know better. 14. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? How, if, they, if, the, if the heavenly host can't, how in the world could I? 15, whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. In other words, I would ask mercy. If I were to have a discussion with my father about uh, my righteousness, and naturally our very best is as filthy rags compared to our father. So what could you say? 
Job probably had it right in indicating, I said indicating, ask mercy. 16. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice? This loses a little in the translation. What it says is, I'm not even sure now that if I ask that, I, that he would listen to a miserable wretch like me. Maybe he's on a little bit of a pity party here and probably at one of his lowest ebbs as he um, begins to, to uh, these debates with his friends. You can tell that yet he's not taking it out on God. Understand that. Verse 17. For he breaketh me with the tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. Now, that, that's difficult to understand. Now, again, you're privy. You know that it's Satan that's doing it. But he doesn't know that. And he doesn't understand how proud our Father is of him. And, and the, the debate between God and Satan was that, Job, you can't take him if I take my hand away. Uh, he's going to stand against you regardless of what. And Job is. But hey, you want to pray that God never tests you to the point that he tested Job. I don't think too many of us could take what Job took without cause. That says a lot concerning his emotion at this moment. Verse 18. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. In other words, he could just let me die. He won't even do that. But, and it seems that everything I turn to do, that it ends up in bitterness. Think of the, the, his health and everything else. 19. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? Who's going to hear my case? Well, God, of course, is hearing his case. But, beloved, if you are a righteous person to the best of your ability and everything goes, let's face it, who are you going to blame? I hope you blame the devil or yourself. You can't blame it on God. Job isn't. But he's having a very difficult time finally getting around to understanding that it is Satan that's causing the problem. Maybe this long suffrage that we see through this book of Job and the ratchet jaw friends is to teach us that lesson once and for all times in your life with repetition to the point that you never forget it. Verse 20. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. If I say I'm innocent would be a better way. Job didn't claim to be perfect, all right? But innocent. Verse 21. Though I was perfect, or better translated, innocent, yet would I not know my soul? I would despise my life. Um, what he's saying here in the Hebrew is my, my life at this time is offensive to me. I'll say that one more time. The Hebrew basically states here, at this time, my life is offensive to me. And I, I'm sure it was. It seemed like every time he tried to get things going back up, something worse happened. Verse 22. This is one thing. Therefore, I said it. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. He destroyeth the innocent and the wicked. In other words, uh, God can do that. It rains on the just and the unjust. Well, sometimes in concerning God's election, that's the way it happens. But now let me reaffirm one thing. God will never interfere in the life of a person with free will unless they ask for it. But God, you go to the other end of the spectrum, those that are chosen before the overthrow of Satan, that were chosen before the foundations of the earth, if you don't understand this, put it on the shelf for a later time, then um, he will intercede in their lives. Why? Because they've already overcome and judgment is easy. 
because he must control to cause the scriptures to come to pass as they are written. That's an insert, um, a word to the wise is sufficient, all right? God is fair, and God knows, this is why it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that God will never place more temptation or troubles upon us than what we can handle, and he will always show us a way out. You can count on it. That's his promise, and I guarantee you he always keeps his promise. You can cut it. Verse 23, if the scourge says uh, slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. Uh, now, now here perhaps is the first time that we see a little doubt in Job's voice and to me is bringing him to the lowest he's been, uh, the lowest ebb that his mind has digressed to, if we want to call it digression, up to this point. Verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? That's a good question. Why would God call? It is Satan. That's who. But he's wondering why, why, why? And I suppose Satan really gets a chuckle out of getting a free ride from people. One of Satan's greatest tricks is to cause people to finally come to the conclusion through uh, various uh, civilizations and their uh, methods of teaching that Satan doesn't exist. Boy, he's got it made when he can get people to become that ignorant. And uh, I know I offend someone when I say that, many when I say that, but hey, it's true. He does exist. He's very real. Verse 25. Now, my days are swifter than a post. That, that means a runner, like the word a postman comes from that speedily goes. They flee away. They see no good. I just, I mean, it seems like my days in this state are just, I'm near the end. 26. They are passed away as the swift ships. And uh, the swift ships means it's the bull rushes of um, of um, the area, and they were known for their uh, for their swiftness. Okay, as the eagle that hasteth to the prey, as he swoops in for the kill, seems like it's going that fast. Twenty seven. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. If I come to that conclusion, and if I say that, 28, I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. His friends are not helping him an iota. You got it? They don't think he's innocent. They're accusing him of lying, of being deceitful, of trying to hold his self-righteous atmosphere when it's not self-righteous, it's righteous. 29. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? I mean, I've tried the best all my life to do what's right. And if it ends out that doing that, I'm wicked, it's been for nothing. That's what vain, empty, 30. If I wash myself with snow water, that's the most pure water of the day, and make my hands never so clean, 31. Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. It seems like every time I make an effort to get my act back together, you slam me right back into the mud. Now, I wonder how many of you that are listening might feel that that's your life today. Then bless your hearts, this is your lucky day, even with trouble, because you know now who causes it. That you'd better get acquainted with your father, you better get into his word, and you'd better put a stop to this malarkey. Because you no longer, uh, as it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, we're given power over all of our enemies. We're children of God, the king. We don't have to put up with that stuff. So put a stop to it. In the name of Yeshua, of Jesus, uh, 
Poor Job had to learn this the hard way to teach us this lesson. I hope I get to shake his hand someday and thank him for the lesson that he brought forth, that he never gave. He stood the, land, the, the, uh, the stand against this one. 32, for, for he is not a man. Our father is not a mortal man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Um, if we were to come together and I were to plead my case and my reasoning. 33, neither is there any days man betwixt us. And thank God this has changed. That, the days man means an umpire par or an arbitrator. And you have one right at the right hand of God now. You do have the legal... Um, the, the legal text would read that he is your intercessor, that he's able to face God for you. So you've got a day's man, as this Hebrew word states, an arbitrator, a, uh, a lawyer right in heaven that might lay his hand upon us both to reason and cause me to understand. And thank God... Uh, I want you to know how much God loves you. In very chapter one, come out the gate, he made it clear to you what was happening here, that it wasn't him, that it was Satan, so that you were privy to that information so you don't have to get all confused in it. You can keep every, your ducks in a row and understand what's happening. Poor Job, he didn't. 34, let him take his rod away from me and let not his fear terrify me. In other words, Job, Job just didn't, he was really having trouble understanding. 35, then would I speak and not fear, but it is not so with me. I am not what I am thought to be. That's kind of what it says in the Hebrew, and he's talking to his friends. They, they think I'm a terrible sinner. I'm not. And God just keeps doing this to me. It would seem only it wasn't God. It was Satan. All right? Don't forget it. He continues in chapter 10. The same, same lecture here between this round of talks. Verse 1. My soul is weary or sick of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I'll freely loose it. I'm going to sound it off. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Verse 2. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Let, uh, let me I'm going to ask God again, Why is this happening to me? Again, though, isn't it sad? Now, God's going to straighten him out before we finish this book. Don't worry. But he said, I'm going to ask him again, why? Why is this happening? Three, is it good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress, that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? There's three complaints there to God. Well, that's, hey, that's getting, but will this make God angry? I think not because God knows what he's going through. And he's pulling for him in the sense he's not going to touch him. He's not going to lay a hand on him because the argument between he and Satan is you can't break him. Satan is coming close here. Probably the closest you'll see him come in the whole book to breaking Job. Only he's not going to cut it. All right. Job is still not blaming God. He's asking why is it happening? Verse 4. Hast thou eyes of flesh? Or seest thou as a man seeth? Do you see like a mortal man sees? Well, we, the answer to that, we all know as Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, he walked upon the earth in the flesh and showed us how to really get it done. Verse 5. And, and this same, self same Satan would tempt him in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. He, he really showed us how to get through it. Verse 5. Are thy days as the days of a man? Or thy years as man's days. And of course, this shows the inexperience of man because, um, because we know different now 
we know that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. Time doesn't mean all that much to our Father as it does to mortal man. Verse 6, That thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searcheth after my sin. He had none. You see, I want you to know, I want you to, I will keep repeating that. Job had no sin. But because of the, of Satan's rigorous uh, drive to break him, he is at a loss to understand it. Mainly because he's not focused upon the evil. If anything, he's saying the evil seemed to get away with it, God. Are you blessing the wicked? No, he was. He was only blessing them in the sense that he allowed Satan to do everything to him but take his soul. Verse 7, Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. Um, but hey, uh, he wasn't wicked. God wasn't wicked, but Satan is. Well, how could Job forget that? Why couldn't Job be aware of that? Uh, we, Job knew that uh, Satan was in the garden. Job knew the trouble that he caused there. Verse 8. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together around about, yet thou dost destroy me. And, and round about means as a potter takes a pot and it goes around and around and he shapes the pot, these clay vessels that are called our bodies. Um, you you uh, fashioned me. What have you? Why have you got it so in for me? I mean, remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me um, as the clay. And wilt thou bring me into dust again? In other words, I came from dust. Are you going to put me back there again? The answer to that, of course, is all of us do. Nine, Ten. Hast thou not poured me out as milk? And curdled me like cheese. Um, and this, of course, being descriptive of origin. And um, if you would, the uh, outcome finally of the body. All right. Verse 11. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. You, you've knit all this together, this body of mine. 12. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. It certainly has up until this time, because Job was terribly blessed. Until now, you have blessed me sufficiently. 13. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart, your mind. I know that this is with thee. Um, suspicion in Job was uh, was it to, was it to uh, was it to throw me off guard? Was it to throw someone else off guard? Um, because you can sense a little suspicion in him here. Verse fourteen: If I sin, then thou makest me, markest me rather. I'll continue: If I sin, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not. Acquit me from mine iniquity. I'm going to, my guilt. I'm, 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 if I'm guilty, I'm guilty. But as Job has said, you know I'm innocent. 15. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head? You know, on high, happy, peace of mind. I am full of confusion. Therefore, see thou mine affliction. And I think, he's, I think he stated a very good case there. He's saying, God, I don't understand. I don't know what to do to receive your blessings again. It seems, to, in my mind, this is where the suspicion line was, uh, was in, uh, incepted there, that it seems like the wicked win. But if I'm good, if I'm righteous, it seems like I lose. I'm, I'm confused, and, and he knows that's not right. Number one, all right? Verse 16. For it increaseth. That is to say, if I lift up my head and try to do right, it seems like the opposition increases. Of course it did. 
Anytime he began to lift his head up, Satan smacked him back down again. Uh, you must add, if I lift my head, because that was carried over from the last verse. Thou huntest me as a furious lion. lion. And again, thou showest thyself marvelous upon me. You, can, you confront me with your marvelous power. Poor old Job, verse 17. Thou renewest thy witness against me. That means the plagues, the sores, the boils. And increaseth thine indignation upon me. Changes and war are against me. You, you send host after host after me. And when I deal with one, uh, then it seems that another comes. There's just one problem Job has, and I, it's so simple. Again, we're privy, though, to behind the scene. God loves you enough that he allowed that. It's Satan. It's not God. It's not really his friends, though they're not any help. You, you need to listen to God, not man. And your troubles, if you happen to be one of God's election, are from Satan. He's got your number. He's knowing you a lot longer than you've known him. That is to say, knowing of him. Satan has a rage against those that overcame in the first earth age, as written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 18. Wherefore, then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Oh, that I had given up the ghost, and no eye had seen me. If I, if I had just aborted Yet in the womb, 19, I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave, 20, are not my days few question, cease them, and let me alone that I may take comfort a little. He's low, all right. He doesn't understand. He's confused, simply because he's not recognizing the power of Satan. 21, before I go whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, 22 to complete, a land of darkness as darkness itself and of the shadow of death without, an order, without any order and where the light is as darkness. Well, and here we see that darkness that has come over him. It was, it was thought at this time by some, this was how you describe the place of the departed souls. We know better, all right? We know from Christ's explanation of, uh, in Luke chapter 16 concerning Lazarus and the rich men, that certainly paradise is not a place of darkness, as far as blackness of a non-understanding is concerned. But Job is at the bottom, and the sad part about being at the bottom at this time is this, that the last of the friends is about to speak his time, and he is worse than all the rest of them put together. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's going to be very cruel to Job while Job is at his very lowest. Will it crack him? Well, we'll see in the next lecture. Don't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The mark of the...